Every Pioneer Day, Utahns celebrate the pioneers who fled religious persecution to create a better, freer life here in the West. But if that respect for religious freedom is at risk of eroding today, what can we do about it? Well, when we increase the circumference of religious freedom, we're typically release, you know, increasing the circumference of freedom for everyone. On this episode, we have a special Pioneer Day edition of Defending Ideas, where we sit down with a couple of state legislators and two religious freedom experts to discuss Utah's unique approach to the issue and how each of us can be more persuasive champions of this principle moving forward. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Defending Ideas is a weekly podcast produced by Sutherland Institute. On this show, we are committed to renewing the principles of common sense conservatism, making you a better champion of sound ideas. Welcome back to another episode of Defending Ideas. I'm your host, Nick Dunn, and this week we're talking about religious freedom. It's a natural time to discuss it because of Pioneer Day, a major state holiday here in Utah that commemorates pioneers who came across the country fleeing religious persecution, looking for a place to live their American dream, where they could live and espouse the principles of faith, family, and freedom. But we also want to talk about this in a broader sense, because the way we talk about religious freedom, the way we talk about the presence of faith in our community really matters. And for those of us who view ourselves as champions of religious freedom and the good that communities of faith can do in society— how we articulate that belief to others who are skeptical or even critical of the role of faith in society and how protected religious freedom should be becomes really important for each of us. So to have this conversation, we're kind of doing a special edition of Defending Ideas. It's almost a little bit more of a roundtable style discussion with a few guests, both joining us virtually and in studio. I'll start first with who's in studio, and that's Bill Duncan, of course, our constitutional law and religious freedom fellow here at Sutherland. Bill, thanks for coming back. Nice to be here. Yeah, thanks. And joining us virtually, we have a few excellent folks, uh, one of whom is Senator Todd Weiler, who's been on the show before. Thanks for coming back to Defending Ideas, Senator. Thanks, Nick. Also, Representative Mike Peterson. Representative, thanks for being with us today. I appreciate the offer. Glad to be here. And and last but not least, Robin Wilson. She's a law professor at the University of, University of Illinois and has done some tremendous work on the religious freedom front. Professor Wilson, welcome to Defending Ideas. Thank you, Nick. So again, I want to thank all of you for being with us. This this is, I think, the the most stacked group of, of folks we've had on one episode at one time of Defending Ideas. So so I'm excited about it because each of you have something really unique to add to the conversation about religious freedom. And again, we really want to hone in on how do we help our listeners out there who might say, I believe in religious freedom, I believe in the, the power that faith can have in our society, but I don't know how to articulate that belief in a way that my skeptical or critical neighbor, friend, co-worker would find compelling. So that's what we want to talk about today. How do we make religious freedom broadly popular across ideology, across geography, across levels of religiosity? So so to start off, um, as we talked about, we're talking about this in the context of Pioneer Day, and there's a lot of discussion and focus here in Utah on that holiday um, because it's such a, an important commemoration of, of folks, again, fleeing religious persecution and coming to, to live free in, in this, this state of Utah. Um, so I want to kind of ask with that general question of how do we become champions of this topic in a way that makes it broadly popular, that can transcend ideological grounds, maybe differences of religiosity? In other words, how can we articulate in such a way that the moderates or the skeptics or the critics would actually find compelling? And I'll kind of open it up to the floor. I mean, who, who has the best first answer? Senator Weiler. Um, you know, we're about 30 years into the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act as ADA, and most people are familiar with the term reasonably accommodate. We're going to reasonably accommodate someone's disabilities under the ADA. The way I like to explain this is um, we're going to reasonably accommodate people's sincerely held religious beliefs. Um, and um, I, I think that's the easiest way to explain it. And I think most people uh, find that, you know, we would say, yeah, I absolutely agree. We should reasonably accommodate people's religious beliefs. Now, if somebody says, my religious belief is I get to travel 150 miles an hour on I-15, that's that's not a sincerely held religious belief. So there's always people that might try to stretch that into something else. Um, but I think 
you know, like something else that we hear about. We all know it when we see it, you know. And so when someone has a sincerely held religious belief, I, I do think that we should bend over backwards to try to to accommodate those beliefs and those traditions and those that culture. Representative Peterson, as the other legislator on our discussion today, I mean, does that track with what you've seen? Both you and Senator Weiler have have successfully sponsored religious freedom legislation here in Utah. I mean, is is does it really come down to that? We just have to focus on a reasonable accommodation. Is that how we kind of all live together? I, I think that's right because, and I think I, I think later on in, in the in the in the segment we'll talk about is maybe some numbers because I because because people are I think by and large people. Are uh, are religious? They have some sort of spirituality to them, and uh, unfortunately, over the last decade, probably 50, 60 years, we've sort of, I think, there's been this sort of squelching of that. That there's something wrong with that. That you know, I'm sorry, but when the Supreme Court has their lemon test and, and sort of says we can't do this religious freedom kind of idea, it's put people sort of on their heels and, and made them feel uncomfortable. Yet in their hearts, in their souls, they want to. They want to have some. Uh, they want to express their, their 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 deeply held feelings, and they want to share it with their friends and neighbors. But they're but they're a little bit nervous about it. We've got to find ways to help them recognize that. Um, that that's part of our fabric, actually, and it's the same fabric that's in that's in me, and it's in you, Nick, and it's in Todd. It's it's all of us have some. Maybe all of it. Maybe is a stretch. Most of us have some sort of a feeling towards that. It, that there's ways we can we can make this happen for each other. Nick, I'll jump in on this too. I know Bill's probably going to talk about some of the numbers, but um, let me just say, you know, as someone who's with college students and university law students, um, younger people, some of them are spiritual, but I think the thing that they really respond to is that they want, you know, in in all of our world, it's about identity. You know, are you LGBT? Are you Christian? Are you Muslim? Are you agnostic? And, and they think in terms of who they are. And I think one of the most important, powerful tools to protect religious people is to connect up to the idea that we should all be able to be authentically ourselves. Religious people can't shed their identities when they walk out of their homes. They want to fully be themselves in public and in private. Right. Not just worship in your home the way that Obama sort of dialed down the idea of religious freedom when he was the president and some of his remarks. And on the other side of that, they get that, you know, gay people don't just shed their their uh, sexuality at the door like a pair of jeans. They don't leave that at home when they go out in the world. And nobody would ask, I think, at least in this younger generation, that they do that. And so I think when you can connect up to just how deep a particular commitment is, whether it's your, your gender identity, your sexuality, Senator Weiler just talked about disability, disabled people don't have the luxury of choosing not to be disabled tomorrow. And it is the reason society has spent so much time trying to take affirmative steps to make sure that people can be fully themselves, whether they have a disability, uh, whether they have a particular identity. And faith is a part of that fabric. It is what makes us this beautiful, interesting, rich nation. Um, and it's a nation that has the ability to make all of us authentically ourselves. We have to write these laws, these gentlemen do that, that allow us to do that. But I think younger people, for them, you know, it's the idea that we don't shed our identities when we leave our homes. Bill, I mean, you're you're our expert here, at Sutherland. You've you've written extensively about this. We've had some major papers come out recently. We'll get into some survey data. But what's your take? Is it? I mean, kind of what I'm hearing is this message of we can promote religious freedom in a way that it actually supports the civil rights of others who are not religious at the same time. Well, we we are releasing soon a publication on this exact question, and and the the theme of the of the publication is is that when we increase the circumference of well, when we increase the circumference of religious freedom, we're typically release, you know, increasing the circumference of freedom for everyone. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Representative Peterson's a good example of this, uh, I think, because of a, a bill that uh, I believe was just last session that he sponsored, we talked about religious freedom, but also the right of conscience more generally. And we've seen through time that as people of faith seek to have protection for, to act on their beliefs, uh, in, you know, in, in the public square and in other settings, that those 
um, decisions in, in their favor often become precedent for others. I sometimes share this example just because it was close to home for me as a, as a teenager. But uh, in, in the school that I went to, there was a, a student who didn't want to participate in cutting up frogs, you know, for uh, uh, dissecting frogs. And um, the, 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 the school of, uh, eventually accommodated her belief, which I think was the right thing to do. But as you kind of start to, to go back and, well, well, who first, who was the first person to start to say, hey, we don't have to necessarily do things in schools that, you know, there are probably lots of examples, but the one that sort of stands out is the Jehovah's Witnesses students in the 1940s who said, we, d- we don't believe in saluting the flag. We want some accommodation of, of our ability to act on that belief. And the Supreme Court issued a really strong ruling, which now that becomes precedent for people, religious and non-religious, to be able to say, I, I, you know, I, uh, my, my conscience, I need to be respected in that. So I think, I think, uh, I think one of us, the strong arguments we can make is that increasing the circumference of freedom for some people increases it for everyone. Uh, and, and, and I think that that's an important part of that. I don't know. We will probably talk more because we actually asked uh, a sample of Utah voters to kind of some of their feelings about this and, and got some insights about, uh, you know, how people feel about these issues. I, I do want to ask Senator Weiler and Representative Peterson, as, uh, as you gentlemen are kind of on the front lines of this in terms of legislative policy, what's being articulated, this idea of if we expand freedom for one group, that actually can and, and should and maybe does expand freedom for everyone. What was your experience running legislation here in Utah on this topic? Is that the message that kind of won people over? Or are there still people skeptical who kind of frame it as an us versus them kind of thing? Well, uh, let me jump in. As soon as my the text of my religious freedom bill went public last February, somebody, I don't know who exactly, but they got a hold of it. And they didn't understand the constitutional uh, framework of strict scrutiny versus rational basis uh, review. And they, they highlighted the language in there that basically uh, said for the government to infringe upon people's sincerely held, held religious uh, view, they'd have to have a compelling uh, state interest and they'd have to do it in the narrow narrowest way possible. So somebody sent out an alert that I was trying to do the opposite of what I was trying. I was trying to make it so the government could override religious beliefs. And they circled that language and said, see, Weiler's a bad actor. He's he's setting up this framework so the government can override religion. When, when in reality, government since the beginning of dawn has been overriding religion. And we saw that during COVID most recently, I think. And what this framework that I put in there with the help of uh, Professor Wilson and others basically said that uh, if the government does do that and somebody sues, then we've set it up so it's very difficult for the government to prevail, uh, which protects religions. But people people read that the wrong way. And even just last week, I had someone on social media attacking me because I passed this bill enabling the government to override people's religious uh, beliefs because they don't understand um, they don't, they don't understand the way the law works, which I understand. They're not all attorneys like I am. The other thing I want to say, Nick, is a common response I got was, "Well, I'm an atheist. Uh, what are you going to do to accommodate my you know my beliefs as an atheist?" And you know, I, I kind of struggle with that because. Um, I respect people who are atheists, you know, if that's what the, how they choose to identify themselves. But that's not a religion, and um, and it's not a faith, and it's not, you know, it's not a sincerely held belief. It, it's actually, a, you know, I don't have a belief, and maybe someone will disagree with me, but I, I don't think we need to necessarily reasonably accommodate atheists. Uh, but you know, maybe I'm in the minority there. Representative, what your experience on that front? Yeah, that, that's funny that you would bring that up, Nick, because uh, the first time I, I, I've been talking about this work with uh, Professor Wilson for three or four months. We we're talking about the, the need for this uh, protecting of conscience. And I was at a meeting with uh, a bunch of higher ed and, and K-12 uh, administrators. And I thought, I'm going to take my, I'm just going to take a, a chance. I'm going to tell them what I'm thinking about to see how they respond. And they responded that now you know what goes both ways, and I and I was glad to say yes, exactly. I, I know it goes both ways. I want I want th- this protection for everybody. It's not. It, I'm not. I'm not trying to pass legislation that just 
takes care of or protects a certain number of people. It's to, it's to protect, uh, as Bill was saying, it enlarges everybody's uh, uh, liberties. So that's kind of a fun. It was a, it was a fun it was a fun experience when they when I was able to come back and let them know. No, this is for everyone. We want to protect everybody's liberties. You know, and and that's a real difference between Representative Peterson's bill and my bill because his bill dealt with moral conscience, which I think. You know, and if an atheist was asked to design an advertising, um, you know, campaign for a church, they might say, hey, can I have a different assignment? I don't really go for church. So I think his bill would, you know, would would take into account maybe, uh, you know, an, an, an atheist standpoint, whereas my bill was held at sincerely held religious beliefs. So I just want to point that out. I, I want to pinpoint that and then maybe Bill ask you to weigh in because it, it it seems like the, the the two pieces of legislation that we're talking about, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that, that you ran, Senator Weiler, and then the, kind of the freedom of conscience protections, Representative Peterson, that you ran, is it right to say that we need to view both of those as linked together? Because I immediately had the thought, uh, Senator Weiler, after you spoke, that, well, if, if I were an atheist and was asked to do something I didn't want to do because of my belief as an atheist— Am I still protected? And it sounds like, well, I am under Representative Peterson's bill, whereas if I'm part of an organized religion and asking for some reasonable accommodation, I'm protected under Senator Weiler's bill. So it's kind of like it's important to view these things together, that both of these pieces of legislation are complementary in a way that actually does cover everyone, does expand freedom for everyone. Is that looking to you, Bill, and then, then Robin as well, is that kind of the right way to look at how we advance the legislative policy? Yeah, I think that's right. The, the 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 key there are there are of course going to be areas where people just see things differently, and and that is uh, that's part of the as as others have pointed out that's part of the benefit of of living in a free country is that we're going to have and there are some things we won't ever see completely eye to eye on. You know, if you don't believe in God and you do believe in God, of course that's going to be a a choke point of your of your agreement. The question is, and, and again goes back to the earlier comments: Is there a way to accommodate the ability of each person to act? To live according to their their beliefs, with the o- only very very narrow exceptions, like like Senator Weiler is describing, where someone's trying to act on their beliefs then creates a serious you know uh, risk risk for other people, and 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 I think that Utah is a good example of a state that where we can demonstrate that yeah that can work it can work to accommodate people in a in a pretty broad way and uh, and robustly protect religious freedom moral conscience and 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 other interests as well. Robin, give us the national lens, because we, we look at these things often through the lens of Utah politics and policy debates, obviously. But from your vantage point, bringing, bringing this national level of expertise, um, is this, again, I want to kind of fixate a little bit on this idea of multiple pieces of legislation can work together to expand freedom for everyone. Have you seen that be a, a winning message, not just in Utah, but elsewhere, or even at the national level? Well, I think we have had wins that look like that, um, that to some extent are borrowing from what both of these gentlemen done. So, for example, the recent Respect for Marriage Act, which was a federal piece of legislation, it, it had Republican support and overwhelming Democrat support. What it did was to ensure that same-sex marriages would not be taken back uh, by a later Supreme Court decision since same-sex marriage came to most states in the United States through court decision as opposed to specific laws like these gentlemen write. Um, But it also gave more religious protections to uh, people who dissent from same-sex marriage than many of those states had in their own state law. And they didn't have protections around marriage because they had not voluntarily embraced same-sex marriage or written legislation like Utah did with the Utah Compromise. So even even from our Congress, which does seem to be locked in place and not able to move on many things, we saw a kind of bipartisan effort to to marry up both religious protections and protections for the LGBT community. Uh, I think what you're seeing in this sort of quiver um, of uh, tools is one of each kind from Representative Peterson and from Senator Weiler. Senator Weiler did a Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which in some sense is a backstop measure. It doesn't make any particular government or actor do any particular thing right now. 
it sits in the background of the law and, um, you know, allows a person of faith who feels like a law enacted 20 years from now unnecessarily encroaches on their religious uh, belief. It allows them to bring a suit to to ask to to have that set aside as to them. Um, what you have with Rep. Peterson is a response to the culture wars, which have come to the workplace. You know, we have librarians in Texas, for example, that didn't want to take books off of a shelf, uh, who were fired out of jobs that they had for decades, even though somebody else could have taken the book off the shelf. Just like in the high school class, you know, maybe it was possible, Bill, not to have the student have to dissect the frog, okay? If we can make that work for people, we ought to. That's a specific law that is, is there making duties of government employers today as opposed to something that may come up later. What I think is interesting is even this legislative session, you had Senator Weiler's RIFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, unanimously enacted. And then you go over to Iowa, where a Religious Freedom Restoration Act barely squeaked across the line. And it got tagged as a license to discriminate. And I think even when you're writing laws that are not two-way street laws, the way that Rep. Peterson's law is constructed, it pays dividends to both sides. You can, when you write a law, make sure to take people's fears and, and, to, and try to address them. And I think Senator Weiler's RIFRA, uh, and maybe he'd like to speak to this, really did that for members of the LGBT community. You know, they were very concerned that somehow their rights would be rolled back. Um, and I think, you know, if we're gonna go forward in a very plural society, we have to be in the business of telling each other that this expanding freedom for religion is not going to harm other people. That's a good thing to tell people. I don't know, do you wanna to speak to that, Senator Wyler? Yeah, sure. I, I think that uh, some people view, you know, if if we give religious people something that somehow that's that th there's the mathematics is somehow we're taking something away from people, you know, LGBT people or whatever or a atheists as we talked about earlier. But I didn't see that that way. I think, um, but we did, you know, in in this 2024 general session of the Utah Legislature. I reached out, I had several meetings with uh, advocates and representatives of the LGBT community to make sure that we included enough language in the bill uh, to satisfy their concerns that we weren't trying to undo the compromise that was reached, I think, back in 2016 or undo, you know, the, 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 the work that had been done for, um, you know, some of the other issues that they felt uh, passionately about, because that was never our intent anyway. Um, and and I, I'm glad that Robin pointed out, or Professor Wilson pointed out, that this is going to lay dormant until the future. We weren't trying to resolve a particular controversy in 2024. We're looking more at like 2044, and you know what, what's going to be uh, the next controversy. And um, a, a big example that I gave, and in Salt Lake City, we had to meet with their attorney several times. Is uh, let's say you have. Uh, a group of Muslim women in Salt Lake that go to a city pool, and I'm not even sure if we have a city pool right now, but I'm just as a hypothetical, and say, you know, we'd like a we'd like a modesty hour uh, where we could swim and not have you know men in the pool because if you know anything about that faith, Muslim women who are devout they would not be in a swimming suit with with, with a man with whom they're not married to to whom they're not married, and so. Um, and so let's say Salt Lake City said, sure, we'll make that every Wednesday morning from 8 to 9 a.m. And then let's say you have some guy that says, well, you're discriminating against me based on my gender, so I'm going to sue you. We want to we want to have the rubric in place where, where, where that reasonable accommodation would be upheld in the courts. And again, we had some of the cities reading that language saying, wait a second, you're subjecting us to lawsuits and blah, 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 blah. Well, those lawsuits would have come invariably without this bill. What this bill said was we wanted to make sure that the courts had the proper standard of review so that if there was a future controversy that the city in that instance would likely win uh, because the, because they are trying to uh, reasonably accommodate someone's sincerely held religious beliefs. 
this sounds like to me that this there's a bigger framework here that the really this is all an outgrowth of the Utah Compromise and kind of these these subsequent pieces of legislation are again further iterations of that this idea that it it doesn't have to be a zero sum game us versus them if one group has more rights the other group has to have the rights contracted it really is this a little bit more collaborative I mean, in, in, in many ways as an observer this is how politics is supposed to work you have various groups various interests coming together at the table figuring out how how do we craft legislation that we're all okay with where we all feel like our rights are protected and that's kind of what what it seems like this approach has yielded here in utah and i i, I want to just touch on that and then ask any of you to weigh in more on kind of again this this is the model of the, of the Utah Compromise, the Utah approach, with respect to religious freedom. But also, can we just copy this model to other policy areas? Because I think of the, Robin, as you said, that what happened in Utah versus what happened in, in Iowa, I believe it was, that why can't we just take this successful model and, yes, export it to other states on religious freedom, but also kind of copy and paste to other policy areas where it we can get out of this, again, us versus them, zero-sum mentality that's plaguing our politics right now. Is this a guidebook for how to do that? Well, let me, I'll take that just off the front, the second part about copy and paste to other areas. You know, um, these gentlemen are the authors of laws, but not the complete set of laws that borrow from the Utah Compromise. And I'm just going to go back and say a word about about the compromise in 2015, it gave more rights to the full LGBT community than that community had in New York at the time. And you may not remember this, um, but in 2015, Utah was the single most politically conservative state in America. It was before Trump and you know the fracturing on that point around Trump. So it was the single most conservative state in America giving more rights to the full LGBT community in housing and hiring non-discrimination than New York. It also combined it, though, with more protections around marriage, faith, and sexuality and traditional views of marriage, not only for large religious actors like the LDS Church itself, but for ordinary people, a clerk who couldn't bring herself as a matter of conscience to solemnize a same-sex marriage, never had been asked to do so, worked in an office for decades before same-sex marriage was recognized anywhere in the world. That, that person gets protected in this law. And that marriage of different interests in the same law gets copied. That's what, you know, Representative Peterson's conscience law, it's a two-way street law, it's agnostic. You can have a progressive conscience, a conservative conscience, you can have your own idiosyncratic conscience. It's marrying the interests of different people. You have an adoption law that Senator Wilson did that takes children and uh, adoptive children and foster children out of the culture war, unanimously enacted, protects LGBT couples who want to adopt, has no one turned away, and no religious agency closed. You have Senator Weiler's RIFRA, which did, did not take anything from anyone, went to great lengths to tell people that it wasn't intended to do that. Um, and then you have something we haven't even talked on, maybe Representative Peterson would like to say something about it, but you know, Utah is the only state in America to ban gay and trans conversion therapy unanimously. And I, I haven't checked this last statement, but I believe it's the single most conservative state in America to ban it. And so again, unanimous law, conservative legislature, one of the hardest topics in America in the culture war right now, because people sat down and tried very hard to understand what everybody who has a stake in that law really cared about deeply. I don't know. Do you want to say anything about that, Rep. Peterson? For sure. I'd, lo I'd love to. Um, I think it was last year. Robin, was it 2023 that we did this? Um, so I used to be a counselor, and uh, I finally saw the light and moved away from that. I, it was too torturous for me. But when I got into the state legislature, I realized that that in our state, um, we'd, we'd pretty much banned um, the opportunity for counselors to talk with with their minor patients about their sexuality. If you, if you 
talk to a child about their about their their sexual feelings, you pretty much uh, you would you would be in jeopardy of losing your license. So so we 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 passed a law last year. We worked a lot with everybody from the Eagle Forum to uh, to Equality Utah to uh, uh, you name it. I mean, there were sometimes. Sometimes and this is not this was tough for me. We had sometimes up to up to eight or eight or nine attorneys at one time in this room, all representing different interests, trying to figure out, Mike, can we have a comma here? Will that be okay? Could we change this to an end? You know, it was it was, but but what we did is we what, what but what we did is we talked with each other and and I kept saying, look, this is the deal: kids have to be able to talk, and counselors must be able to talk. That's the that's the goal. Who's going to who's going to argue against that? And so so we were able to we were able to land on some uh, on a framework that that worked. And as Robin said, it passed unanimously in both houses. Uh, there was in fact there was not a single testimony spoken against it. And then uh, as Governor Cox has traveled our state last year, he went to every every county, and I believe he spoke about this this law in every 20 and all 29 counties in in regards to this disagreeing better because that's what we did we uh um we found a way we found a way to to answer everybody's needs and everybody's conscience and and i don't know i, I hope that helps i think it does i want to i want to touch on some of the survey data that that we have um, from sutherland that's brand new survey data we've got about 10 minutes or so left, because I think there's, again, just thinking through anyone listening out there to this discussion of, okay, well, how do I then take this and kind of operationalize it in the way I talk about religious freedom or the value of of faith in, in the community? And there's, I mean, to use, I guess, a legal term that, Bill, you'd use a lot when we talk about this from court, but kind of the balancing test of, you know, how do we balance this value of religious freedom in a way that doesn't feel to other people groups or identities that is just com- completely eviscerating their rights either. And so that that approach, I think, is really telling. And Robin, I particularly appreciate your perspective of how Utah has been really unique in this space that might be surprising to folks based on some of the stuff you might hear otherwise in the news and on social media. Um, but but I, I do want to ask for you all to weigh in on, on some of the survey data that, that I'll, I'll go through, because you haven't seen this yet, this is brand new from us, but just kind of get some thoughts and then frame it in terms of, well, what's next? What, what's on the horizon for religious freedom? Those of us who, who want to champion this principle, what do we need to be aware of moving forward to, again, continue to make this an idea that's broadly popular? And, and Bill, in particular, I want to start with you and, and touch on some of the, the survey data that we have from Sutherland. So, so we, we regularly survey likely voters here in Utah to get their views on various topics. And, and this latest data set asks specifically about religious freedom, both how they feel about it generally, as well as how if it has the right level of protection. And the top line result was that 82% of Utah likely voters say that religious freedom is a net positive for society. So that's a huge majority. I mean, 82% would be a landslide in, in any election by sure. So vast majority of likely voters in Utah say, yes, religious freedom is a net positive for society. Um, and in particular, that support is strongest among 18 to 34 year olds, which kind of pushes back against a stereotype that young people are dis- disillusioned by faith. So first, Bill, those top line results and anything else you saw in the data, give, what's your reaction? What do you make of such strong levels of support generally for religious freedom here in the state? Well, I'll be writing a lot about this in the next little while because it, it is it is so interesting. Um, I, it's obviously very positive, and I think, I think Utah has done a good job of um, – Exemplifying the message that religious freedom is a is a um, is a core freedom, isn't that positive for society? And that message seems to be coming across. I, I'm not entirely surprised that that young people are supportive because I think, in a lot of ways, they're right at the they're right in the kind of the front lines where there's a lot of, like like Professor Wilson was describing earlier, there's a lot of. Um, uh, disagreement about, uh, you know, here's my life and here's your experience and how do they interact with each other. And I think they have in some ways to figure out a way to, to, 
to to accommodate you know other people and so in some ways it's just really quite positive that 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 number is so high. Having said that, there are some things we learn because we're not looking just to say, hey, look, everybody thinks religious freedom is great. We also want to understand, are, are there some, is there some some nuances there that are important? And we found some of those. Uh, for instance, um, although uh, belief in religious freedom itself is almost overwhelmingly strong, people are, are, are supportive. And that's true across uh, uh, political ideology, across uh, religiosity. There is some breakdown as we get to the question of whether religion itself is is a, a positive benefit to society. Again, m- most people said yes, absolutely. But um, those who are not associated with a religious faith or are not practicing any religion are less likely to see that. So I think that was an area where we thought, okay, we, we could do better in communicating this message that this panel's been describing uh, to to everyone, because some of those kind of older ways of looking at kind of a, a zero-sum game, you know, way of looking at, at freedom uh, are still around. They're, they're still felt by some people. And so the message, that, that message could get out. And, and in particular, one, one area where probably the, the, the weakest is when people of faith act on their beliefs uh, in 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 I say in public I don't mean just like on a public street or something but but it, as they're living their lives and uh, that there there's a little less support for that again pretty pretty strong support but but less than than maybe we would have hoped and I and I think Professor Wilson mentioned that exact question what about this employee who's just kind of living her life and is affected by a religious freedom dispute. We need to we need to shore up that kind of recognition. But I think that what we've been talking about is the way to do that is to help people to see that um, we it, it, we'll continue to disagree about things that are important because that's that's why they're so important. They're they're debatable. But um, but in addition to that, we can still find ways to work together and allow people to to act on their beliefs in public uh, without without harming other people. I think I think that's possible, and and we'll we'll be working on you know how do we how do we share that message as we go forward. I want to pinpoint that and then get the thoughts of of Senator Weiler, Representative Peterson, and Professor Wilson. I want to share two other quick stats and then ask all of you to weigh in, kind of react to what what Bill's describing, and and again from from this new survey data. When Utah likely voters are asked, well, is religious freedom protected the right amount or, or too much or too little? That Here's what the breakdown looks like. 31% say that religious freedom is not protected enough. 49% say it's protected the right amount. And 20, 20% say it's too protected. But then there is a pattern with religiosity. So as people who are not at all religious have very different numbers. So for example... Among those who are not, who dis- describe themselves as not at all religious, 62% say religious freedom is protected too much, which implies that maybe they would be supportive of some of those protections eroding. So just knowing that there's broad support, there are some nuances in that. Um, Professor Wilson, Representative Peterson, Senator Weiler, how do, you re- how do you react to that? What does the survey data tell you as far as what we need to be thinking of moving forward on this issue? Well, let me jump in and say, you know, I, I do think people's opinions and their attitudes are very much shaped by how they identify themselves, their background, their mindset. So there are people in Utah, for example, who are not members of the predominant religion who are, are kind of bitter and and, and take a, a negative view to those things. Um, so those statistics, I think, are very insightful. You know, I I think it's George Washington in his, uh, in his farewell address said that in order for us to be a prosperous people, we needed to be a moral and religious people. And I think the most most people recognize that inherently. E- even, even the non-religious of the founders, um, you know, they signed on to the Declaration of Independence that had phrases that were religious. Because even 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 though they weren't not part of a of a specific religion, they recognized the need uh, of, of that religiosity. And I tell people, um, you know, if we want to go for neutrality, I say, look, you, you folks there, Sutherland, I, I, you're, you're in Salt Lake someplace. I'm in North Logan. And if I ask you to drive to my house and keep it in neutral, you're never going to get here. And and we want, we want as a society, we want each other, we want our children to go someplace. We can't go in neutral, and we need some values, some some morals. So, uh, and I think. Back to your numbers, I think that most people inherently recognize 
that necessity. Yeah, Nick, I'll just say, uh, let me just come back up to the 60,000 foot level for a second. Just look at the country. We have what's called the rise of the nuns. We don't mean nuns with a religious collar here. We mean people who have no affiliation with a religious tradition. And that has gone and increased, 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 including among some younger people. I want to talk about why I think younger people are the hope for us. Um, tomorrow's leaders have grown up with unprecedented diversity. As Bill said, they, they sort out in their friend sets how to help each other be authentically themselves without giving anything up. Like they, they work it out in their relationships. And if you need proof of that, um, you know, go to a, 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 an initiative that I created called Tolerance Means. So www.tolerancemeans.com. And you'll see essays by all of these young people across the nation talking about how they want a different kind of world. They don't like the cancel culture that they've inherited. They don't like the deep divisions. And the overwhelming majority of them have sorted out how to leave room for their friends to be authentically themselves while also enjoying the same thing. So I think they're the way forward. But nationally, we're in a pickle. People of faith are increasingly in the minority. And when you're in the minority and the things that you're asking for push back culture sometimes, push back the arc of culture, you know, people see that uh, as sort of a, a hateful message that the, the, the difficulty is that religious claims get caught up with the idea that they are hateful. Now, the laws that you've just heard these gentlemen describe are advancing the interests of people other than non-religious people at the same time that they're advancing the interests of religious people. It's not a zero sum, as Bill said. In fact, that rising sort of tide takes everybody to have more freedom. But unless you're writing those kinds of laws, you are going to increasingly over time have a much more difficult project because people are walking away from faith. They see it as hateful. We, we're about at time, but, but I, I want to make sure if anyone has any sort of burning thoughts that they're still able to share. So, so I'll, I'll ask this last question and then answer it however you, you, you need to. But the final question for me is, if you bump into somebody, you can frame it as the elevator pitch question, right? You're in an elevator with somebody, you got 30 seconds before they step off the elevator, and they say, hey, Senator, Representative so-and-so, Professor so-and-so, hey, Bill Duncan, I've seen your work. If they say, I'm not religious at all, I'm really skeptical of this, convince me why I should be supportive of religious freedom, of the role that faith plays in society. And if this person says, I got 30 seconds till I get off the elevator, so, so now's your shot, maybe Bill will start with you and then anyone on virtually with us, what's your final thought? How do we win over that person? Well, I, I, I think par part of the answer will be... Uh, that I, I would want that person to see how important my faith is to me and how it changes what I do. And, and, I, and I think, I think what, what most people of faith will experience is that as they um, act on their faith, they, they act on their feeling of accountability to God, their, their lives are better, they make con contributions that everyone can recognize, and, then, and, and as a result, we'll, we'll want to be supportive of, uh, of, of faith that produces that kind of result in a person's life. And, and I think, uh, you know, just common sense tells us that if that's going to happen for me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to extend that same uh, courtesy to you. So, so let's work together, I think I would probably be my, my response. It's a heartfelt answer. Our legislators thoughts? I would, I would say um, that uh, my bill, the Religious Freedoms uh, Bill, is designed to protect the minority interests in the state. A lot of people think that, oh, this is another way for a majority religion um, to kind of roughshod over people, but, but it's a actually, uh, it's usually the minority religions who get the most protection out of these bills. And um, I think most people have uh, some sympathy for the little guy. So, Representative, you have thirty second elevator pitch. Yeah, I, I think what I would say is, you know, for, for the last, as I said earlier, 
for the last 50 or 60 years, we've been sort of under the, we've been taught that, that religion, spirituality cannot be part of the public square. And, 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 and so, you know, I passed a bill this last, this last session to allow school teachers to include the 10 commandments in their curriculum. And I was, uh, I received more than a more than a handful of hate hate letters from around the, around the country, people asking if I'd ever heard of the First Amendment or separation of church and state. Did I know where that was? And, and I think that's 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 engendered sort of an, uh, a bit of an anger amongst people because I think they they misunderstood that I, I don't think our founders wanted a separation. They didn't want to establish a church, a state religion, but they but but religion is is a good thing. It it helps us. It gives us reason to, to, to be better and to be kinder and to be more helpful with each other. And, and as, a, as a community, we're better as we help each other in whatever way I want to exercise my religion. Uh, we're better when we help people um, exercise, exercise some sort of spirituality. Well, let me take a crack at that um, and be the typical professor and fight the question. Um, you know, we're talking about religious freedom and I think religious freedom um, and the laws that are there to protect it have gotten a bad rap. I think they're misunderstood. I think the laws that have been discussed here today are efforts to actually allow all people to be authentically themselves. And many of these laws marry the interests of groups that no one thinks can ever get together on any particular thing. Um, and advance, advance the interests of both of those groups. And, um, you know, I'll just say as an adopted child, for example, that when Senator Wilson introduced a law that said that no gay couple should be turned away if they're qualified from an agency, they need to have people help them. I was cheering because my family changed the whole arc of my life. I want that for any child that doesn't have a family. And when that same bill said no religious agency should be shut down, um, they need to be authentic too. I was cheering because those agencies help children like me be placed in families. They helped families like my mom and dad actually adopt children. And we have to recenter our thinking to realize that when we protect other people's rights, we're often protecting our own. And religious freedom is not, you know, a bludgeon, um, but it does need to be done um, and put in laws and nuanced ways like we have heard today so that it's not inadvertently um, advancing the interests of one set of people without thinking about all the other people in our society. Well, we are about at time, so we will leave it there. I, I want to thank each of you. You've been so generous with your time and expertise helping us talk through how to champion religious freedom in a way that can help take this sound idea and make it broadly popular. And so we hope our listeners are, are well-equipped now to go and, and champion that. Well, I want to thank again Senator Todd Weiler, Representative Mike Peterson, Professor Robin Wilson, and of course Bill Duncan here at Southern in the studio with us. Thank you all for being on this kind of special roundtable version of Defending Ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thank Thanks, you, Nick. Guys. Well, we're going to take one quick break before we leave you with some final thoughts. This is Defending Ideas. We'll be right back. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with the latest policy debate that affects your life. The solution? Subscribe to Sutherland Institute's weekly newsletter, where you'll find in-depth insights from seasoned policy experts, compelling multimedia, and advance notice of special events. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. Before we wrap up, there's a few notes that I captured in the form of talking points that I think we can use from our panel of guests that we had discussing Utah's approach to religious freedom and how each of us can champion it moving forward. There are really three main things that I captured that I wanted to share with you. Number one, if you're talking to someone who's skeptical or even critical of religious freedom, remind them that it isn't really an us versus them kind of principle. We can protect and expand protections in the law for religious freedom in a way that protects or expands freedom for other people as well, for all groups. It can be broadly inclusive as evidenced by Utah's approach. That was one of Robin's points in the, in the discussion today, that Utah did it in, in a unique way that brought a lot of different groups to the table 
to create consensus around protections for many, many people here in Utah. And that can be a model for other states and the national level as well. The second point is, if you're talking with somebody about this issue and you're a person of faith, share how your own faith changes you, how it's formative, how it compels you to be a different, better person, both in your personal and public life. If you're genuine in sharing that, I think that'll really have an impact on the person you're talking to. They will see that in you and hopefully respect that experience in your own life. And number three, remember that there is a wide range of societal good that comes from the presence of people, communities, and organizations motivated by faith in some way acting in society. And that good extends to people who are not necessarily religious themselves. It's beneficial broadly across society. Driving home that point, whether you're talking about the social services that religion provides or the other broad societal benefits of faith-based communities in our state and nation, that can help elevate the understanding of the unique role that faith can play in our society and strengthen perceptions of the benefit of religious freedom, in particular for folks who may not have as much direct experience with a particular religion or a group of of faith congregants, if they don't really participate in that way, they can still see some of the broad societal benefits that are beneficial for everyone in our state and nation. Well, we hope that you've enjoyed this episode and that you feel better equipped to defend some of the ideas we talked about today. If you like this episode and you want to subscribe, make sure to head over to defendingideas.org where you can access this show on all of the major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, wherever you like to listen to your shows. You can just go and search for Defending Ideas on your favorite platform and click that subscribe button. Also, make sure to subscribe to the Sutherland Institute YouTube channel. And if you do, click the little bell icon in the corner so you get notified each time a new episode drops on YouTube. That's every Tuesday morning. And lastly, if you want to support the broad work of Sutherland Institute, if you want more conversations like this, more multimedia product products that help articulate these principles in a compelling, persuasive way, please visit sutherlandinstitute.org slash donate. That will do it for this episode of Defending Ideas. Thanks so much for being with us from the Sutherland Institute in Salt Lake City. I'm Nick Dunn. We'll see you next time.